Well, welcome everyone to our MAR guest lecture for today. Uh, it's on tomorrow's jobs today, as you see on the screen. And we have two presenters today, the co-editors of the book, Raphael Muscatel and Abby Muscatel. And uh, I'm going to take just a minute to give you the bios of both of those so you understand where they're coming from. Uh, Raphael is Managed Director of Compliance and Privacy Partners based in Los Angeles, California. As a tr strategic business advisor, Raphael has over 20 years of experience leading successful digital transformation programs for the Fortune 500, uh, including Paramount Pictures and Farmers Insurance. He's responsible for helping organizations develop and refine their IT governance, compliance, and privacy roadmaps. As a certified records manager, certified information privacy manager, and information governance professional, he specializes in designing defensible global information governance policies and has an extensive background in project delivery, audit remediation, and change management within highly regulated industries. He's also the author of Tomorrow's Jobs Today, Wisdom and Career Advice from Thought Leaders in AI, Big Data, Blockchain, the Internet of Things, Privacy, and more, uh, which uh, if you cannot order it yet, will be out shortly. Uh, the co-editor is Abby Muscatel. She's a California trial attorney for State Farm Mutual Automobile Insurance Company. She combines her love for the law and passion for emerging technology by writing and presenting on ethics and admissibility of evidence related to IoT and social media. She obtained her JD from Southwestern Law School's Accelerated Scale Program and her BS in Legal Communication from Ohio University. Before law school, Abby was based in Washington, DC, where she helped pioneer the use of the internet to mobilize students nationwide to lobby for increased access to federal financial aid. Uh, and now I'm going to turn the mic over to um, Raphael. Well, thank you for that introduction, Pat. And uh, uh, But it's an absolute pleasure to speak to all of you today about a topic me and my co-author, Abby, have been you know, really passionate about over the past couple of years and that's the subject of careers and specifically careers in the information age, in the age of automation and digital transformation. And I think we're among a group that understands that, you know, emerging technologies are creating prosperity, but also anxiety. And uh, so many of us, even those of us raised, you know, at the dawn of this era feel overwhelmed by uh, the power and the risks associated with, with what our future brings. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by telling you just a little bit about myself. I'm a compliance and privacy consultant. So uh, as you were saying, I've spent my career working with regulated companies uh, like Viacom and Farmers Insurance for the past 20 years. And that prepared me to discuss the material that we're about to share with you, because along the way, I've had the chance to work with and meet a very diverse group of executives. And I'm honored to be here with my partner, um, co-author, Abby Moscatel, who I'll, I'm going to turn it over to now to give you her background. Abby? Thanks, Roth. Um, yeah, hi, everybody. I'm Abby Moscatel, and I'm an attorney with State Farm Insurance. Uh, just a disclaimer, the opinions I express here today are my own. They don't reflect those of my employer. But I'm really excited to be with all of you today because this is the perfect forum to share some of the stories we've collected about business leaders with people who will be the next generation of them. Some of you may already be working in the emerging fields that we're gonna to touch on. It's a lot of fun to think about tomorrow, but one of the best ways to envision the future is to look at where we are today. Okay. So we're gonna start this presentation with some background on the job market based on some of the data that came out of the most recent Future of Jobs report put out by the folks over at the World Economic Forum. And this is perfect for our discussion today because we open the book with this grim outlook by Klaus Schwab, the executive chairman, which we suggest that you just take with a grain of salt. 
Yes, we know that automation is impacting job demand. But the other part of the story is, as you can see from this slide, that it's a job creator in the long run. And while a lot of tasks can now be automated, like the data entry and accounting and factory work, as you see, we also have a lot of opportunity popping up for specialists in AI, big data, digital marketing, and strategy. Making that change will be difficult for many people, but reskilling is not a new concept. Humans are all about adapting. So yes, there will be a struggle, but there's also going to be rewards. Right. And a big part of what sets the winners apart, or at least say the survivors, are their soft skills. Now, in the future of jobs report, there were 10 soft skills considered the most bankable. And I want to call your attention to two of those in particular. The first one is emotional intelligence, which ranks sixth on the top 10, and something that we're calling cognitive flexibility, which is number 10. So with cognitive flexibility, we find this one interesting because we have a little quip here at the bottom calling it the artist formerly known as multitasking. But the unique thing about this skill, which separates it from traditional multitasking is this idea of thinking about multiple concepts simultaneously. And we believe that's a quality that we've seen many of the profiles that we're going to share with you today. Don't you think so, Rob? Yeah, Abby, it's okay. It's undoubtedly one of the qualities. And I think most of the people that, that, we, that, that we interviewed had mastered a lot of the top 10 list from the WEF. And I suggest you go and, and check out the report, which is uh, on their website. They, they published it. Uh, just a little while ago. Um, but we also found a few themes across the board and in each industry. And that's how we're gonna preface this, this next series of slides. So these, uh, these three main themes we picked up on were, and, and the key takeaways for today are that, uh, one, gaps are opportunities. Two, less is more. And perhaps most importantly, above all, relationships matter. And they are, those are kind of high level themes. We're gonna get a little bit more granular as we, as we kind of get into that. Um, but let's, uh, let's just jump into that first theme, gaps or opportunities. And here you see this JFK quote, which is inspired by the Chinese characters that are, that are used to write uh, the word crisis. On the left is the brush stroke for danger. Uh, and on the right is the one for opportunity. And you know we think this is fitting because while not all the people we spoke with are necessarily dealing with a crisis, like say a Cuban Missile Crisis, they are perhaps experiencing gaps and holes in their programs uh, or at their companies that, that feel like a crisis. And they're finding ways to apply both their expertise and those soft skills that, uh, that we just talk, talked about to, to put a positive spin on what might be a challenging set of circumstances, like say a compliance audit or a regulatory fine. And wait, wait, wait a second. Before you talk about Michael Moon, Roth, can you just tell the story about the scrap metal king of Albuquerque? Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know what? It's appropriate. So this is a story. This is a story we tell in the book to illustrate the concept of gaps being opportunities, and it comes uh, from the first part of the 20th century. And it's about a weary soldier returning from World War I. It's a true story. And as, as it goes, the GI was exhausted but thrilled to be alive, you know, after so many of his friends had been killed and so much of the world had been destroyed. Uh, and he was discharged in California and he was put on a Pullman train uh, packed with other vets traveling from San Francisco to the East Coast. Um, so he, like, like the other soldiers, uh, he began drinking and enjoying spirits in the bar car. And by the time they crossed over to New Mexico, most of the train's passengers were quite drunk. So naturally, overconsumption can lead to brawling and uh, bad things. And that's what occurred by early noon. He, he had hold, held his own, but eventually he was actually thrown from the caboose about 15 miles outside of Albuquerque. And in those days, that, that was like the middle of nowhere. Uh, and if that wasn't bad enough, he only had enough money to buy himself a bus ticket to finish the last leg of the trip. 
So uh, slightly inebriated and out of luck, he began walking down the road parallel to the railroad tracks towards town. And as he sobered up along the path, he started noticing a lot of broken down sedans and pickup trucks along the highway, um, which had run out of gas. Uh, and this is eight, 1918, so it's before GPS, and there's no gas stations, it's in the desert. So, you know, the young man, uh, he thought a lot about that as, as he was, you know, passing by those clunkers. And, and in between each one, in between each one, as he made his way to civilization, he, he starts thinking about what the vehicles represented. So by the time he finally made it to town, he had kind of come up with an idea. And despite being parched and sinking a high heaven, he abandoned his plans to purchase a bus ticket, ticket and he used what was left in his pocket to put a down payment on a tow truck. And the next day, he fills up the tank and he sets back down that road he had traversed the afternoon before. And, you know, what, what would you know? He, he picks up every one of those lonely jalopies and he drags them back to a lot that he'd also rented from the, the person who gave him the tow truck. Um, and then less than a decade later, that same GI was the third largest scrap metal salesman in the Southwest United States. And by the time he died, he was about the richest man in Albuquerque. Um, now he never made it home to Boston, but he did learn about how your journey is often more enjoyable, uh, more profitable than arriving at your destination. So we bring that up to you uh, folks because we're saying, you know, when you're in a role that we, you should be asking yourself, what are my broken down jalopies? What are the business processes, products, uh, the teams uh, that are broken down or in need of repair around my organization or my community? And you know, how can you, like that GI, turn a really you know, tough situation into one that benefits you, um, but ultimately the world around you? So can you identify those gaps along the stops uh, on the way to your goals? And can you seize that day? Um, so, uh, you know, just be thrilled uh, as that, as that soldier was, uh, the day he was thrown from that train. Um, but getting back to Michael Moon now, um, and we think, we think that the size of that crisis or challenge really isn't important as what you do with it. Right. Okay. That's why we opened the book with a forward by, uh, by Michael, who's one of the very, you know, big startup coaches in the Silicon Valley. He advises many companies that you probably use every day um, when you're online and he's a futurist. And he talks about how the world rewards those who parlay small wins into stupendous gains, small wins into stupendous gains. And we think that's so powerful because it's so true. Um, history is chock full of, of you know, uh, People maybe not reinventing the wheel, but definitely improving upon old concepts and finding value in something that was perhaps obscure up until that point. Uh, you can think about everything that was done, um, you know, has been done with the monetization of data, which up until recently was seen just as an operational uh, resource or a customer service tool. And that's now the driving force behind some of the largest companies on the NASDAQ. Um, it was written about in, in a great book, if you ever get a chance to read, called uh, in, Infonomics. And of course, now there's this other side of the equation, which is privacy. And I think Adam will talk about that in a few minutes. But the point is that opportunity is there. And, uh, and it's, it's not just in large organizations. We find this opportunity uh, with entrepreneurs. For example, the person we spoke with uh, when we kicked off the book was Ashish Gadness. You can see him here. Um, he's in Africa. Uh, and this guy's life is, it, it's all about opportunity. Uh, not just the ones he has uh, carved out for himself from growing up in a slum in India to becoming the head of the Wall Street Consortium on blockchain, but how he's applied the skills he learned in previous compliance roles to spot gaps, to fill them. And, and that's what he's doing right now with his company, BankQ, which has, for the last few years, uh, been using blockchain technology to create economic passports for women farmers in impoverished regions in Ghana and Zaire using only SMS phones, which we all know is more affordable than the latest iPhone. Um, and he realized that people in the last mile of the supply chain were often left out of the process of getting a product to market. 
So we, so we fill that gap with economic empowerment using blockchain. And so that's what we're talking about when we say gaps are opportunities. And Ashish, um, he used to do Sarbanes-Oxley work, which is, you know, seems very mundane. It's fantastic how he was able to use that skill set and make it transferable to something even bigger. Um, and it also helps that he's got a computer science background. And we're going to take questions at the end of the um, at, at the end of the discussion. So if you could please just put them in the chat, we'd love to hear your thoughts on blockchain, IoT, AI, what some of these people do. So please feel free to load up those questions. We'd love to answer your questions and engage with you. Uh, Dr. Anand Rayo, here's this is another example. Um, he's the, the global artificial intelligence lead at Price Waterhouse Coopers. Uh, this gentleman has over 30 years of experience with behavioral economics, risk management, statistical and computational analytics. He's written extensively about AI. Um, he has some very strong feelings about the technology. I think we all probably do. And he talked to us a lot about uh, how deep learning is not equal to what he calls deep understanding. And he sees, he sees more and more universes being discovered beyond just what we see today. Uh, in machine learning. But it, it was interesting because when we asked Dr. Rea to provide some guidance uh, for a new person entering the field, he noted it's the mundane and routine processes around an organization uh, that PricewaterhouseCoopers feels are often the best place to mine opportunity. And it's in those gaps that we're able to build, you know, first these small bridges, but then these larger ones. So the cerebral insights, they drive the vision but the applicability is in the details of what goes on in the back office. And again, that's, that's an opportunity for a, for a wide range of skilled workers and even people just, just dipping their toes in a data lake for the first time. Now, uh, that opportunity is, it's sometimes slightly different from the experience you might have working for um, a public entity, a government, a nonprofit, um, which some of you probably want to work for, uh, like Dr. Jones Lucos. You can see him here with the guitar. He does sing um, and he plays music. Um, he actually uses that to get his, his message across sometimes, but he is the information management officer at the criminal court in The Hague in the Netherlands. And uh, Dr. Lacoste has spent uh, quite a lot of his time identifying opportunity because he's an efficiency specialist by training and specifically in information management. And in his capacity in, in this highly sensitive environment that is the hog, the decisions that uh, he has to make about directing the flow of information as evidence is presented before the public and, and in front of judges, both kind of like in real time with a slight delay um, which you can read about online and, and, and how he partnered with uh, Adobe on this. But this process can literally mean life or death for a witness in a major, uh, a major trial. Um, so anyway, in this case, there is opportunity, but there's very little room for trial and error, pardon the pun. Uh, but when Dr. Jones came into the position, he was dealing with kind of an old fashioned set of knowledge management tools. So you know, he had his work kind of cut out for him. And over time, he's been successful because little by little, he's parlayed those small wins that Michael Moon talked about into enormous, enormous successes, into a system that serves the public interest, that ensures justice. Uh, and that means even for some of the world's most despicable criminals. Uh, another trailblazer, that we explored the idea of, of, of uh, gaps and opportunities with was Kevin Gray, so you see him right here uh, in the nice suit. He's the chief information officer for the city of Burbank. Uh, they're considered a smart city. Some of you guys have probably studied those. Um, Kevin is to us one of the finest examples of opportunity because you know he's been in the seat a few years now uh, but he did a lot of time in infrastructure. He's played almost every position on an IT team and even worked for other divisions. And when the opportunity came to uh, lead the IT systems and, and, and the group at the city of Burbank, 
he was primed for the role. And he said that his experience at Viacom was just absolutely the key to his success and that private sector gave him skills that he could apply directly uh, when he started working in government. Because Burbank is the kind of city with a very active citizenry. And that's an excellent incentive for Kevin and his team uh, to modernize and to innovate and to perform. They're both encouraged and supported, but there's pressure on them, um, which is good. And Kevin's used to all that pressure. He faced it in the fast paced uh, roller coaster, emotional roller coaster that is the entertainment industry. If any of you have worked in that industry, I don't necessarily recommend it, but there's a lot of money to be made there. Um, but there's uh, a lot of fun to be had. There's a lot of fun to be had. Come on. But uh, he believes, you know, the opportunity to work with the business is the essence of the solution. Then the technology is, a, is, is secondary. It's a tool to accomplish that ultimate goal. Um, and that, that now brings us to Priya Keshev, um, who, you know, like Kevin, took a chance on a new career, became a, a, an entrepreneur a little later in life. She was a pretty big deal at KPMG, Abby, and you know it was there that she she started to switch gears from litigation support and e-discovery um, over to the Internet of Things or IoT. She saw so much opportunity in the technology and uh, and data and so little governance around it, which drove her which drove her crazy. Of course, I mean she understands how much data is created. She couldn't stand it. Yeah. Well, when you think that we create two point five quintillion bytes of data every day by some estimates on these devices, it would drive me nuts too. But I'm not sure I would create software to solve the dilemma, uh, which she did with- You tried. Yeah, I tried, it didn't work, <laughs> didn't work. Um, but, uh, but her company Maru Data now competes with you know, major players in the business like OneTrust for a piece of the privacy market. So Priya found an opportunity in that tsunami of IoT data and she's made a small fortune providing those solutions to some of these data-driven companies uh, like Airbnb, uh, which are you know, now being forced to rein in you know, some of their activities because of all the privacy regulations out there like GDPR. Right, right. Uh, now, a lot of that data is, of course, in vehicles, which is where the field of telematics sits. And one of the, uh, they, can, they cannot turn people out fast enough to, to, do, to, to do these telematics jobs. No, um, when, we spoke, when we spoke with John, he was saying that it's just a big area of hiring. You know, the State Farm is looking for people, other companies are looking for people to do telematics, it's huge. But the technology is so new right. that they can't train people fast enough uh, for this. So, and there's so much investment in the technology. Um, so one of these people was uh, who, who kind of sits and thinks about how it impacts not just we know about our driving habits, but how we use it in practical situations, like when you're paying out a, or investigating an insurance claim, uh, is John Dannenberger. And John came out of the military with a background in, in analyzing this type of data and these types of patterns. We know that in many cases, the military or the government will test these technologies five, 10 years before we even get it in our hands. So he, he was able to kind of uh, work with that and he seized on it, uh, the opportunity at State Farm, he was, he, was, he was perfect for the role. And we're not at the point where all, we're all in you know, autonomous vehicles yet, but I want you all today to kind of think about the data. Uh, and, and I want you to think of the delta that we have between today and tomorrow's jobs when it comes to all that data, how many how many people that we're going to need to understand, to parse, and to explain that data to the courts, to executives, and in so many possible scenarios. Do you have anything else to say about that, Abby? Are you? You know, I just think that one example that John talks about in the book is that we're coming up on this technology, not only to help us drive our cars, have autonomous vehicles, but then also just for safety. You know, for example, if all these cars have telematics data and everything is, is connected, then you'll be able to say, okay, there's somebody ahead of you. You know, they've changed lanes 10 times in the last 60 seconds. Like you might want to take off and take the next exit, you know, and things like that. So we're going to see a lot of different applicability of the technology. I agree. And I think uh, if you're trained in the best practices and in an information governance program like San Jose State University, 
that's that's probably going to set you up in a way that other that other people might not uh, be able to adjust as quickly to because you're walking in there with a set of best practices and standards that others don't have. Absolutely. Um, so now you might think that most of that opportunity that we're talking about is in Europe or America, but the fact is there is a lot more on the continent of Africa than you might imagine. Uh, you look at a state like Nigeria, it's a veritable metropolis. Um, there are hundreds of thousands of jobs um, in AI, big data, uh, you name it, that we're gonna see developing down there. And one of the people who knows that best is Dr. Oyewole, uh, and he runs a group called the Institution of Information Management. Um, it's an upward mobility program, and he's been a force uh, for opportunity for some decades now. He takes um, young men and women uh, throughout throughout the various nations in Africa, and he, he educates them and he gives them tools to compete in this information economy. Uh, he's a very business oriented man, uh, but he's also all about transparency. So he thinks that's critical. He believes having a society where quality records and information can be easily accessed must be a priority. And that's what we think too. And we actually interviewed somebody from the Joint Chiefs of Staff who we're gonna share some information with uh, on Freedom of Information Act requests, who, who, who's he's pretty much in charge of that process at, at the Joint Chiefs of Staff level. Um, but I wanna summarize these three points for you guys. And uh, it's this, uh, to find the processes and needs. I mean, they, these can be found in all parts of the business, but in the information age, we see them tied to compliance and legal obligations more than ever. Uh, next, identify a tool set or an, you know, an efficient, defensible strategy that addresses compliance or regulatory needs, or even a team that needs to be reskilled or perhaps restructured. Um, and the third point is, you know, not to forget to market all of those benefits to your stakeholders and to your business partners. Uh, make them as much a part of the solution as you are. Abby. Thank you. The second thing we picked up on in all these stories is this idea that less is more. Less is more. And that rings true when we think about all the IoT data that Bria handles. We're on this crest of the wave of this deluge of data. And so while there's a lot of talk about here, we're still trying to keep it brief and to the point, which is why we included this image in a quote from the artist Piet Mondrian, who stated it was not important to make many pictures, but that you have one that's just right. And that's a strategic principle that guides many of the leaders we're about to introduce you to. Anita Allen. The idea of less is more is crucial concept when you think of privacy. When you think of privacy by design, when you think of the principle of least privilege in a data security setting. And data privacy is a really big deal right, right now, we know this. Yeah. We have laws being passed from the GDPR to the CCPA, which I'm sure you're learning about right now. And so everyone's ears are perked up but we wanna know how is this really playing out in the marketplace, right? We see an explosion of privacy jobs out there. And though privacy is this timeless concept, the intersection of technology and privacy is new. So there's a lot of opportunities there. And speaking with Dr. Anita Allen of UPIM, and she told us that she thinks the oversharing era may be changing with a new generation that demands privacy and demands trust. Yeah. And, 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 I, I'd say, Abby, too, we'd be curious to, see, you know, really hear what all of you think about this because, you know, it's something that affects all of us. Um, is privacy dead? Is it going to come back? I want to know what you guys think. Yeah. Um, I have my own opinions about it. But if we look at the regulatory landscape, maybe she's right. We'd be curious, again, what you think about it. Um, regardless, we believe there's a solid career path in academia for this because somebody is going to have to educate the workforce on this discipline. And Dr. Allen's a great example of one of those educators. In fact, she wrote the first casebook on privacy. 
Now, George Sosha, like Dr. Allen, is an attorney by training. But George is in the private sector, so he has different views about how all this plays out in the real world outside of the classroom. And George is a real heavyweight. He really is. He was a co-founder of the EDRM, the groundbreaking tool that helped the legal community look at the digital ages legal discovery process and shaped e-discovery's marketplace future. So George got tired of depositions. I hear him. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many depositions am I doing? Um, so he took a chance as a young man right after the Peace Corps and headed up his firm's information technology department. Yeah. yeah. So he had that firsthand experience of case management because everybody would just come to him, right? And try to make, he had to make sense of all these different moving parts. So here's what he did. He designed this visual representation of the process, which has come to uh, be known as the Electronic Discovery Resource Model or EDRM which is likely used, is widely used now, and it has a home with a law school at Duke University. So George knows a thing or two about simplifying things. And he's done that with EDRM, EDM, excuse me. The EDRM. <laughs> EDRM, because he knows that when it comes to discovering data that matters to a good outcome, again, less is more. Right. Advance the slide here. Thank you. Now that strategy kind of contrasts with that of Dr. Ulrich Kempmeyer of Project Consult over in Germany. Ulrich is a fascinating guy, right? Because he was on the ground floor at the beginning of enterprise content management. And now he's moved into working on AI projects for his clients. And he uses ECM tools as well but kind of accepting that the role of man in business processes is diminishing at an exponential rate. When we talked to him, he straight up told us that with artificial intelligence looming ahead, we might have to define what work is. He says, man is no longer the scale, the ruler, the canon. And we respect that perspective, of course. Because he's right in that many jobs have been eliminated and that work itself is being seen through a different lens, but we're not ready to throw in the towel just yet. Right. And neither is uh, Marcus Lindelow. Right. Over at Iron Mountain. Marcus is an analytics expert out of Texas. He works for one of the world's leading information management companies, Iron Mountain. Marcus is an example of how AI works well with humanoids. <laughs> he does. He works with humanoids. <laughs> because in partnering with Google AI, Iron Mountain, and Marcus were able to apply these unique algorithms to their vast inventories of data that they consider dark and unknowable until they use AI. Right. As a result, they can classify enormous amounts of company records and destroy them safely. So it would be interesting, I think, to get Dr. Kampmeyer mm -hmm. and Marcus in a room. I think we should just let them slug it out. Yeah, maybe, or maybe, maybe give them a boxing <laughs> robot toy instead. That's probably better. Um, what about April Dim Dimitrenko? Can you switch a slide sure. for me? Thank you. Okay. So given these two perspectives, we went and talked with April Dimitrenko. We wanted to get a middle of the road perspective. Uh, April is actually Raphael's longtime mentor, isn't she? She is. Yeah. She summarizes what we've been talking about in her quote that we have right here. When she says that simple always wins over the complex. Simple always wins over the complex. And she's talking about that in terms of the customer experience. Obviously, some processes have got to be complex. I mean, you look at an SAP upgrade for a financial services company, you have to be skilled in data governance to pull that off. But what about the C level reading the dashboard? Well, they have to be that they have to be able to see that as easy to use and straightforward. But so in that sense, yes, less is less is more. Again. Yeah. yeah. Right. And if I could, before we move into the next section, I just want to give an example of how this idea works in practice. Perhaps the most famous business that exemplifies the value of the less is more strategy, and you'll know this, especially if you're in California, is In-N-Out Burger. 
a restaurant chain with 300 locations. And it was founded in 1948. The secret of their success is attributed to the simplicity of their menu, which hasn't changed much in 70 years. But what the observers fail to realize while they're in that, in that line, waiting for their burger, is that while less is more has made that storied food hub tremendously successful and scalable, it's anything but extraordinary or, or original. In fact, it's really, when you get down to it, it's just a fundamental strategy that powers small businesses everywhere. Thousands of miles from the nearest in and out in just a short drive from Mechanicsburg, Ohio, there's this family diner just as loved as a local there as in and out to is to Los Angeles. And I know that because it's in my hometown of Urbana, Ohio. Crable's hamburger shop serves up two things, sliders, and homemade potato chips. Oh, they're great. Cash only. Right. <laughs> People drive from miles around to sit in this six seat counter restaurant. They wait in lines outside without a complaint for this legendary lunch. Yet despite numerous opportunities to franchise a business, the family run company has been resisting expansion since 1927. Yeah. They're comfortable with their profit lot and there's nothing wrong with that. The secret of Crable's success is no different from that of In-N-Out. Less is more. A proven strategy that enables businesses to effectively execute on their mission and focus on keeping operations running smoothly. And I, I can guarantee you if they scaled, they would be successful, but they have personal reasons to hold on to that. Their, their restaurant is like, 30 feet by 30 feet. And that's it still yeah. to this day. Yeah. Yeah. Do you love it when you go there? I do. Ah. Maybe we can franchise it. They won't let us. <laughs> but to go back to the main point here, try to present opportunities for better governance of data by taking the less is more strategy. Don't overwhelm your business partners help to reduce expenses and monetize a project or product lifestyle using the same strategy. And lastly, use the right cadence, keeping it light to maintain focus on those customer experiences. Uh, our final point here is that um, relationships matter. So the last theme that we gleaned from writing this book and we know, we know that this may seem like a no-brainer, but it's that relationships matter. And we know that you're going to come out of school as subject matter experts. Um, and, uh, and that's, you, 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 can't, you can't operate without that. Um, but we, we do emphasize this point about, about relationship building because especially post-COVID and Zoom, uh, where in-person experiences are limited, Relationship building is actually more important than ever. We have a, a colleague who just wrote a book about, about this. Um, so you should want to get to know uh, and, and take the time to get to know the people that you're working with, uh, even if you're going to maintain somewhat of an arm's length relationship. And at the end of the day, we think it's people that make the business. Uh, and as Henry Ford uh, you know, had once said, um, we, we put it on this uh, right here on this, this slide, that you can take my factories, burn up my buildings, but give me my people and I'll build the business right back again. And we, we think it's true because we've seen it happen a lot of times before. Uh, you know, entrepreneurs come out of bankruptcy and they'll build empires twice the size and power of the, of, of the previous one. Uh, one of the best conversations we had about building relationships. And I alluded to this um, a little, just a little bit earlier when we were talking about uh, Dr. Oyewole and uh, the transparency need uh, for records and information in Africa. Um, uh, but but was the, the person we spoke to about this was Mark Patrick. Um, he runs the information management team for the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the US government. Um, so this guy's very tight-lipped. I'm surprised we got any information out of him at all. Um, I remember when we drafted the chapter, how many uh, different, um, you know, back and forth versions had to occur with everything with, with had the to be approved. Everything had to be cleared. Yep. 
So Mark deals with a lot of confidential and sensitive materials in his role. Uh, and he talked to us at length about the Freedom of Information Act requests. That might be something uh, that you know, you'll know colleagues who work in, um, given what, a, what an important role that plays in, uh, in our democracy. But we found his insights on relationships most significant because and we just talked to him the other day. Um, he stressed how critical they were in helping him to do his job um, at, in the government. He hasn't always been in this field. He was a helicopter pilot for a while before he, before he uh, took on this role. Uh, but he, he reached out early on in his career to organizations like AIM, um, and he made uh, incredible friendships with people who helped him plan his strategy and incorporate best practices into the work he was doing. And now he spends more time with them on a leisurely basis than he does um, you know, just exchanging ideas. So that's a pretty powerful experience that he shared with us. And, you know, we think everybody can, can benefit from, from that. I, you know, and just to add, can I add one thing? Sure. Um, you know, what Mark was talking about was, you know, he's in the government and sometimes the government is not exactly known for being super efficient or super uh, forward thinking when it comes to technology. And so he stayed in the government, but then he used the organization like AIM to figure out how he could bring that efficiency and forward thinking back into the government. And it's made him such a big leader. And I think that so many people within his division are, are looking up to him now. To oh yeah, that. absolutely. It's too bad that he's actually close to retirement, but here, there you go. It's an opportunity because a gap in uh, Mark Patrick's employment is a job for one of us. Um, but let's go on. I want to talk to you guys about Dr. Katrina Miller. Um, who you see here and Dr. Katrina Miller runs the informatics department at a private uh, public partnership called LA Care Health Plan. Uh, LA Care Health Plan is the largest group of its kind in the, in the United States. It's, it insures and services thousands of people in the public sector. It's a very, very large organization. If you're in Los Angeles and you're just sitting and waiting for the bus, uh, you'll see the buses go, go by with their advertisements. Her career uh, is interesting because uh, she began as a medical doctor. She is, a, a, I think, an internist. And over time, her work evolved. So she's now doing population health, examining large sets of data to do things like spot trends that might help LA care customers have a better quality of life. But she also finds billing fraud, and she's very good at it. Um, and you know, that can lead to criminal charges. That can, you can get in a lot of trouble for that. Uh, but on the day to day with her staff and colleagues, you know, she brings to the table just this whole set of skills she honed as a physician. She practices emotional intelligence every day and she practices cognitive flexibility, which lets her kind of bounce between, you know, interrelated, uh, you know, corporate challenges and substantive challenges and, and see them kind of as one, not as one issue, but be able to be able to think of them in, in, in some more nuanced ways. And that brings us to Patrick Sweeney. I was excited to talk to you guys about Patrick. Um, he, he's, he's like Dr. Miller because he began his career uh, in library science. He was, a, he was a librarian by trade and he made a move that allowed him to leverage his uh, experience in the same general space. You can see him over here. He's got a big idea and he's communicating. Um, he, he actually taught at San Jose State University. I'm not sure if he's still tenured there, Matt. Uh, maybe Pat can tell us at the end of the talk if he's still there, uh, if you know. But um, he's all about relationship building because he's in the field of politics now. Um, and working for every library, which is his organization, his job is to build awareness for public libraries because they depend on the government for funding uh, to provide that essential service. So one of the things Patrick's been doing to get people to understand that libraries aren't just about books, um, that they're about information, you know, is going out and talking about that. That idea, you know, when he said that to me, it, it kind of rattled around in my head. It's not about books. It's about information. It's about information. And it's about a service that we're providing to the community. And, um, and we all get that, but at least I do now, but not everybody else does. And Patrick builds relationships with people so that he can impart his message and it can resonate 
And his message is that the whole of a library is much more than the sum of the books on its shelves. And uh, Patrick is uh, it's not the only leader who we spoke to about libraries and collections. This is Andrea Callis. She's the SVP of Asset Management at Paramount Pictures, an archivist by trade. Uh, she, uh, she had some thoughts about relationship building, which we included in the book. And what we like about Andrea is that, you know, besides the fact that she is committed to preservation, she sees um, other members of her field in a glowing light. She has a lot of hope. She sees them having a dedication to recognizing a path that's worthiest to the world that they work in and live. She really loves working with millennials. Yeah. Um, she really loves She it. loves working with everybody. With but everybody, but she just sees, um, a lot of you, like she just sees how smart you guys are and everything that you have up to offer. Well, what, what I like about Andrea is because in many cases, um, when I was working with her at Paramount, she, uh, she, you know, she would kind of face calls to change out a person or whatever, and she was willing to take a chance on people. Right. Um, and that that made her stand out, and people people really that's why she's so regarded. Anyway, Andrea served as a, a president of the Association of Moving Image Archivists, and she's served as the head of preservation for the British Film Institute. And now she's over at Paramount and they're, uh, they're redoing The Godfather and she oversees the, uh, those efforts. So um, wrapping up here, I, you know, what we can kind of learn from these trailblazers, uh, the first is, okay, just to build those relationships with IT, risk and compliance groups. Um, you may be in a different, you might be in a product group, you might be somewhere else, but I just want to point out those groups because there's a lot of goodwill to be harvested and shared in those detail oriented types of divisions, especially if you're working with information and you're, and you're working with granular details and, and all of that. The second is, you know, we say plant seeds and try to be a gardener rather than the flower every time. And I, I took that out of a movie, but I can't remember what it is. That's a good one. Um, and, you know, we also say, you know, a bouquet is often more beautiful than a solitary rose. Um, and, and finally, like Andrea, when you find yourself in a position of influence, and we imagine you, you all will um, uh, and, and, and have before uh, or, or have now, to maintain, uh, uh, to remember to nurture the right talent, to execute and maintain the vision that you have, uh, because we believe that that's how you ensure uh, a legacy. Absolutely. Okay. So we want to leave you with one final piece of advice. And it's the lesson of this book, which is to run in the direction of your fear. If we cower in the face of disruption, our ideas will get stale. Our skill sets will grow old and our energy to adapt will decline. We hope that by absorbing the observations and advice from people in love with these new careers, we can transform anxiety over the winds of change into opportunity. And as you embark on your journey, we hope that you can share your story with us. And we thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abby and Raphael. That was wonderful. A uh, lot to think about there. And uh, if any of you have a question, put it in the chat area. And uh, while you're doing that, uh, I just want to say, yes, Patrick Sweeney is still teaching for uh, SJSU uh, in the MLIS program. And uh, this semester, he's teaching a course on political advocacy, uh, which fits right in well with the last part of your uh, book on uh, who you know, uh, because he's uh, teaching uh, individuals who work in the library sector how to act just the way community organizers, political action committees, and other politicians work, the strategies they use in order to gain funding and other resources for their own organizations. So uh, if anybody's interested in political advocacy, you've got a course there that runs, I think, almost every semester you should look into. That's wonderful. That's fantastic. Uh, if you don't have any questions, you're welcome to provide any comments if you'd like to do that. 
You mentioned that you wouldn't recommend the entertainment industry. Could you speak more on that? <laughs> well, I uh, yeah, I'm just bringing that shot up on the thing. I yeah, I I say that kind of uh, half-heartedly. I I did work for Paramount Pictures, and the entertainment industry can be a roller coaster. There's a lot of personality uh, in it, to say the least. Uh, but my experience uh, working with Paramount Pictures was excellent. I don't want to diminish that. I, uh, some of the finest people that I ever worked with um, were there. Uh, and I, I learned quite a bit about cadence uh, from, from the leadership. And I also worked at a, a, another company called uh, Relativity Media, which was a, a film financing en entity um, in, in the late 2000s. Uh, they were excellent. So no, I don't want to I don't want to deter anybody to work for this. And I would say that actually it's quite uh, fruitful if you do pick a, pick a, a role in, in that industry. My experience with the entertainment industry has always been on the defense side of litigation. Before, uh, before I went to State Farm, I was doing a lot of that. I would represent different companies in different ways. So I always saw the worst outcomes of things and the mistakes people would make in the entertainment industry. <laughs> Yeah. That often happens with attorneys, I think. Uh, I want to make a read a comment by Mary first before we move on to the next question, uh, because it's on this topic. She said she used to work in television. It was fine while she was young and single, but not uh, later on in life. So sometimes our, our choices for our careers depend on where we are in our, our uh, um, private lives as well. I agree with you. And uh, Pat, if I just may, one thing my wife had mentioned to me was that as you transition through different uh, periods in your career, you're going to pick up different uh, perspectives that you can actually apply uh, to it, um, which is why we felt the book was good, not just for people who are just coming out of school, but also uh, if you know people who are transitioning between positions or have anxiety about, about uh, new roles. You know, we found, uh, here I go again before the next question, but we found that with our students in our programs, uh, regardless of the backgrounds that they have and whether or not they're uh, uh, in uh, the early stages of their career or they're looking to transition, everybody brings such a different perspective that they make the, the classes richer and the program richer just because of that, because we're all sharing. Uh, so uh, I, I read your book uh, from beginning to end, and I found it fascinating. And there's quite a bit I'd like to go back to and, and spend a little more time thinking about myself. Uh, there is, uh, before I move on to Stacy's, we have a question here from Carissa, uh, who thought this was an inspirational discussion. And she'd like to know if you have any advice for someone working in an organization uh, who does not pro prioritize or even value records management and therefore doesn't spend much money improving the program. Wow. Should I take that one? Um, I think you should take that one. Go ahead. Now, so this is the perennial question, um, but it's also what ends up kind of creating the need for records and information people. You know, it, it's so difficult to, 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 to advocate for yourself uh, and for your program when you have a, like what we call a blocker in, in the organization. And that third uh, stage of relationships matter, I, I, one thing we didn't really get too far into was that it sometimes takes time to get through to an executive or another individual. Um, what, I, what I think has been very useful right now is to bring the executive or, or the sponsors or the, 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 the business, business person you're working with, bring their attention to some of the privacy issues, some of the data protection issues uh, that are affecting uh, the organization globally. And may I add something? Yeah. Um, another thing that I would consider doing would be just to get involved with different organizations in that field, because it's such a common issue and there's going to be other people who have gone through that process and who have, you know, successfully persuaded their company to, to put more emphasis on this issue. But generally, I do think that the profile is being raised and I, I, I don't think that privacy is necessarily the silver bullet, but you have to figure out what is going to perk the uh, executives ears up and what, how you can relate it back to something that they need. Um, so, so that when, when it, the time is right, you've developed that right relationship and you've gotten them thinking that, and if you have to, that it's their idea. 
uh, or, or that they're, it's, it's something that's really going to affect them. Um, and of course, there's situations where you're just going to have a difficult person and it's, it's tough to get around them. It's an opportunity for you to um, take the time to really under, you know, just to figure out what the risk is, too. Go ahead. Thank you. I see something here. Uh, we have two more at least questions, but one is by Stacy. Uh, she said her friend Steve Toady is it worked for Paramount and is kind of known for his Seize Today brand of inspirational video footage. She wondered if uh, you are connected because of your use of the term Seize Today. <laughs> no, but uh, please connect us because I'd love I'd love to talk to him if he's a current or a former uh, alumni. I would love, I would love that. I've always been a fan of Carpe Diem and seize the day. So Stacy, get in touch with their presenter today and uh, see if you can make a connection for them there. I love it. <laughs> All right, Mary asks, how does one go about learning about telematics if you're not in the auto industry? Well, there's a really good chapter in the book <laughs> that you can get started. <laughs> Um, and then the, it, there's different service organizations and different industry organizations that are focusing on telematics right now. Yeah, but as we as as we were mentioning, it is a, a, a very early in, in the states. Pat, you probably know more about what the plans are from uh, the schools of information management. But I think it's uh, we might have even t talked about it in a prior uh, meeting and, or touched on it to some degree, but. It needs to be something that we start offering courses and curriculum around. It's just that the, the, the technology moves so quickly, uh, again, that it's hard. What I would say is um, the insurance companies are a great place to uh, get work in this, in this area uh, because they are dealing directly with the impacts of it. Um, in fact, if anybody has an insurance, well, I hope we all have insurance if we're driving, but if you do, you likely have the, the, the insurance company likely offers a, uh, an app that sits with you um, in your phone, which you can use. And that's actually uh, telematics in action where it's monitoring uh, your activity and then it's going back and, and that information is feeding back into the underwriting process. So you can see very, it's a very good question because like we said, if we had to pick one or two areas of highest growth and most need. Healthcare and, and auto. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Healthcare and auto are getting disrupted right now. Um, if you go to our website, there'll be a recap of everybody that we spoke about today, and then you can um, find them on LinkedIn or find them on social media and connect with them that way too. We encourage you to do that, and they're really nice people. So the website is right on the uh, slide there. And uh, to uh, as far as telematics, uh, when you mentioned that earlier in your presentation, I quickly jotted down a note uh, and I was thinking uh, it really would be uh, neat to put together maybe quickly uh, a, a survey course in the new types of uh, uh, opportunities that exist, uh, including something like telematics, at least to be able to inform our students beyond a, a webinar like this, uh, what it might be, what would be involved and where you could go for further uh, instruction if you were really excited about the field. So I made myself a little note that I'm going to pass along and if there's any discussion in our school about this uh, on any side, whether it's the MLS MARA or our new uh, informatics uh, uh, degree that we have as well. So I'll do a little exploring there. Uh, it's the, our time is up. So I just want to, <laughs> Mary thinks it sounds like a blackboard buster course. I, I, I just want to thank you uh, for your presentation. It was fantastic. Thank you to everybody who attended and your uh, very good questions. Uh, I really appreciate that and enjoyed uh, spending time with you here today.